Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the Big Bang. Um, so this is our current theory for how the universe began, and, um, and, and the story is actually pretty interesting and quite complex. And one of the things I want to do today is talk about why we believe that this is what happened. So we only have one lecture. It's quite a complicated story, and there have been, you know, of order 80 years of research that have gone into figuring out what the predictions are and what the observations are that lead us to believe that this is what happened in the history of the universe. As with a lot of the things in this course, I want to emphasize the fact that you know, we're not just making this stuff up, even though it might seem fantastical. Um, there are a lot of reasons why we believe uh, this picture for the evolution of the universe over the last 14 billion years. And I want to at least give you a flavor of that today, although it's complicated enough that I won't be able to go into every detail, but I want to just talk a bit about these things. So first of all, I wanted to take, take a step back and remind everybody uh, what we've kind of learned about what the, um, what the composition of the cosmos is over the last, you know, over the, over the course. So if you recall, um, I talked about how a big component of the universe seems to be in this, this stuff that we call dark matter. And dark matter is a type of material that attracts itself, attracts other things gravitationally, but other than that, as far as we know, doesn't interact in any other way. So it's, and that's a very, very weird type of material. It's unlike anything that we're familiar with in our day-to-day -day lives, but we think it's there because of a very large amount of astronomical observations that point in that direction. There's an even weirder type of stuff out there um, that we call dark energy. And this is the stuff that's driving the universe to expand, uh, to accelerate in its expansion. As I talked about last time, the universe doesn't seem to be slowing down as it's expanding, which is what you would expect because gravity should tend to tug on everything else and slow stuff down. It's actually speeding up in its expansion. And this is just as weird as uh, having a tennis ball thrown up in the air, and rather than it slowing down and eventually coming back down, it actually speeds up as it goes up as if there was some kind of anti-gravity that drove it off, off the surface of the Earth. Dark energy acts in that way. It's a very, very mysterious uh, substance or behavior. Um, and just because we have given it a name, dark energy, doesn't mean we have any idea what it is. But the weird stuff, is, the weird thing is, is if you add up how much um, density and energy there is in the universe, we can take a measure of that. Even though we don't know what this stuff is, we can still measure how much contributes to all of the energy and density of the universe. And it turns out that this dark energy, the weirdest stuff of all, is 70% of everything we know. And the dark matter is 25% of everything we know. And the remaining 5% of the universe, that tiny sliver of the pie, is everything else, and that's the stuff we're familiar with. Okay, so only 5% of the universe is made up of stuff that we would conceive of as being normal. That would be on the periodic table or the kind of atoms that make up you and me. So that's kind of crazy. Um, and the other thing that's bizarre, I mean, sort of extreme in that, in that way, is that the heavy elements, so the elements that are, I mean, really heavier than helium, um, make up only about 0.03% of everything that we know. <coughs> and that includes you and me. So what we are made of is a very rare substance universe. So, so my philosophy on all this is, this does not mean we're insignificant, this means we're very significant. You know, we're pearls on a string. We are extremely rare stuff. We're like platinum or plutonium or whatever you think is rare and interesting. Gold, right? That's what we're made of. We're made of this very, very rare stuff, and we're sitting atop this floating iceberg and below, whoa, <laughs> I had that all planned for effect. Um, <laughs> we're sitting apart, sitting atop this floating iceberg, and beneath us is all the ice, and we're just the tip of the iceberg. Um, let me turn something on so that's a little freaky. Uh, okay, so the question now is, so we have this, we don't know why the universe is this way, but we've discovered that this seems to be what the universe is like. And um, I'm here to tell you that I don't know why the universe is this way, but as, as we begin to ask questions about how the universe came to be, maybe it will enlighten us a little bit about why the universe chose to be this way and, and uh, how we can make sense of all that. Now, you recall that uh, in 1929, Edwin Hubble made this miraculous discovery. He discovered that 
the galaxies out there in the universe that had just been discovered were all heading away from us. And even more uh, strange than that, the galaxies that were farther away from us were going away from us faster. And this type of behavior is what you get in a system that is expanding. Okay? So this is evidence that the universe is expanding away from everything else. So everything is moving away from us and part of this universe that is expanding. The eventual, um, so eventually this was realized that this could be incorporated, this behavior was naturally incorporated in Einstein's general theory of relativity uh, that, that said that space itself is dynamic and the way space behaves and evolves is, is, is governed by gravity and governed by the stuff within it. And Einstein's theory could actually incorporate this expansion very, very uh, naturally, actually. And in fact, I think you might remember that there were some hints that the universe should be expanding even before it was discovered, but Einstein had dismissed it because he just thought it was too weird. Um, but then when this was discovered, everything started to fall in the pla into place theoretically that, okay, something is going on here. So after this, people began to think, all right, well, what does this imply if we really take this to the extreme? That the universe is expanding, well, if you run that back in time, the universe is smaller and smaller and smaller. And we had that whole discussion last time about the age of the universe and how old the universe is. Run it back, run the clock back to zero until everything is back to an infinitely small point, and that's the beginning. But how do you know this really happened? I mean, all I've really told you is that the universe is expanding now, but that doesn't necessarily mean that in the past the universe was smaller and that there really was a big bang. Okay. So how do we know that, and, and why do we think, what other evidence do we have besides this kind of thing that this is what's going on? Um, so the current picture of the big bang is something like this. That very, very early on in the universe, well, at the beginning, at the very beginning, space and time began. So space and time both began at something like 14 billion years ago. Um, and since that time, the universe has been expanding. The other thing that's going on is, as the universe got bigger and bigger, it cooled off. Okay? So you can imagine that if you had... Uh, a balloon filled with hot air, and you allow that balloon to expand and expand and expand, the air inside that balloon would cool off. That's a natural behavior of matter. Um, to put it another way, if you had a box with a bunch of air in it or anything in it, and you squeeze the box and make it smaller and smaller and smaller, the stuff inside that box would get hotter. And you can imagine that one of the reasons why this happens is because you know, what is going on with air? I mean, what really is temperature in a room? It's something like the average speed with which molecules are bouncing off the sides of the room and bouncing around. So air in this room is moving really fast. It's actually moving as fast as a speeding bullet, literally. And as it gets hotter in the room, the air molecules are moving faster. That's really what temperature is. It's a measure of how fast little air molecules are moving in the room, in some sense. Um, and as you confine that air, confine anything to a smaller and smaller uh, volume, it will get hotter. And one way to think about that is, you know, now the, you know, now the molecules are getting are bouncing off walls more, more often, and they're getting gaining some energy, and that bounces as the as the walls squeeze, and you gain and gain temperature. So if you take anything and you squeeze it and make it smaller, uh, it will tend to heat up. And sometimes you'll notice that if you've ever, I mean, a similar effect is if you hold a bicycle pump and pump it. Sometimes you'll feel it get a little hotter in the, on the out on the out while you're holding the outside of that pump. Um, so anyway, uh, we think that as the universe, as you run the clock backwards to earlier early and earlier times, the universe is hotter. And today we know that the universe is quite cold, but in early times we think the universe was hot. And this is very important for asking the question, did this really happen? So the picture is something like this, that although today the universe is very cold, we think that the space itself today is about three degrees above absolute zero. So it's extremely cold, minus 270 or so degrees uh, Celsius. So very, very cold. Um, but as we go back in time towards the Big Bang, the universe is hotter and hotter. So for example, 300,000 years after, today it's 14 billion years after the Big Bang. If you go back all the way just 300,000 years before the Big Bang, um, we think that it was something like 3,000 degrees. So just the ambient universe was 3,000 degrees at that time. And if you keep going back before that, for example, one second after the Big Bang, the temperature of the universe was something like 10 to the 10 degrees. So extremely hot. So hot that, um, well, so hot that in fact it's impossible for atoms to have existed at that time. 
So let me explain to you what I mean. So imagine we were all in this room. Well, maybe we should leave the room first because we're going to start turning the heat up. Imagine we started turning the heat up in this room. Eventually, if you turn the heat up high enough, the, the chairs would melt. Okay, it would get so hot that, that all solids would just begin to melt. And you could keep heating the room up. And if you kept heating the room up, you wouldn't even have liquid chairs anymore. That liquid would begin to evaporate. And begin, you, you would begin to have just gas. Just, just like boiling water. I mean, it's a less gruesome way of thinking about this is you just have an ice cube and you heat it up in front of the liquid. You keep heating up that water, it turns to steam. So as things get heated up, the state of matter actually becomes less structured, can become less structured and more sort of fluid, more gasoline. But then you can envision heating that up even more. All that gas is heated up more. And eventually, the molecules in the, in the gas run into each other and break them apart. It's, they're moving so fast that when they hit each other, they might break apart into constituent atoms. If you keep heating those atoms up, eventually the atoms can't even stay together. The electrons that are orbiting around the protons can't hang on. Those atoms collide, the electrons pop off. And that's, called, that's what's called a plasma. You have an ionized gas that you have free electrons and protons and all in nuclei all messing around. And in fact, that's what we think is happening in the early universe. It should have been so hot at early times that anything complicated could not have existed. It's just too hot for complicated structures to have existed. So what happens is you're, as you go back in time and the universe gets, gets, the universe gets hotter and hotter and hotter, you get to a point where everything is just is made up of its constituent parts, constituent particles. So in that sense, it really is a primordial soup because it's, it's the constituent things that make up everything else that are just free-floating. And it's not cold enough for complicated things to exist. Now, as the universe expands and cools, more complicated things can happen. And so we have this vision that in the early universe, it really was like this primordial soup of constituent particles. And as the universe cools, more complicated things can begin to form. So what happens, what's interesting here is one second after the Big Bang, it was too hot for atoms to even exist. But as the universe cools down to around 300,000 degrees, it becomes cool enough for the protons and neutrons that make up atomic nuclei, the protons that make up atomic nuclei, to grab onto electrons and keep hold of them. And suddenly you can make neutral hydrogen, or neutral atoms, whereas in the past you couldn't even do this. So why does that matter? It turns out that that's a very important thing. Um, and let me talk about that now. So the picture that we have is something like this. Now, this is supposed to be like a timeline of the universe. It's very cartoony, so don't take it too seriously, obviously. But now, this is today on this side, on the left side here. And on the right side, this is supposed to represent the beginning, the Big Bang. And as the universe expands, it cools. And as we go back to time t equals zero, it gets infinitely hot. It's very, very hot. If you go back far enough, it was so hot that all the constituents that even make up atomic nuclei, atomic nuclei can't even hang together. And they're broken up into constituent quarks, for example. As the universe cools, then nuclei can begin to form. And as the universe cools beyond that, these nuclei that exist can now grab onto electrons and make what we think of as normal atoms. Now, the weird thing is, before, this, before um, the electrons can hold on to their electrons, sorry, before the, neutrons, before the protons could grab onto their electrons and make atoms, um, light really couldn't travel very freely. Okay? Um, and this, this matters and, and, uh, because it turns out that there's a very specific event that happens right at the time when the electrons get bound to atoms and light begins to travel freely, because we can see this. This is a period of time in the past that we can actually look for and see if it exists. So where am I going with this? So the first piece of evidence besides this Hubble result, the universe is expanded, um, had to do with something called the cosmic microwave background. I'm going to talk to you about that now. So what is the evidence that we have for the Big Bang? So in the 1960s, this guy named Robert Dickey was doing calculations about what the universe should be like in these early times when it was very hot. Um, and he realized that there should be an observable prediction that 
basically from this epoch, 300,000 years after the Big Bang, when atoms became neutral and light began begun to, to fly, to, to, to freely travel through the universe without bouncing off of stuff, um, that she should be observable as a signal in the sky in the microwave, in the microwave radiation, and that the sky should look like it was three degree, a three degree black body temperature everywhere you looked. So let me talk about that a little bit more. So for the first 300,000 years after the Big Bang, it was so hot that there were all these electrons and charged particles flying around. And it turns out when you try to shoot a light ray through a fog of charged particles, it bounces off of them. So if you were in the early universe before this time when, elect when atoms were neutral, there were all these free electrons floating around, you try to shine a flashlight, a light wouldn't go anywhere. It would be like a fog. So like when it's really foggy and you shine a flashlight, you don't see anything. Okay. So you can think of it, it before this time, before this time 300,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe was effectively foggy. And no light, no matter what light was going on here, could ever propagate very far because of this. But 300,000 years after the Big Bang, suddenly all those electrons that were floating around went away because atoms grabbed them and held on to them. It was no longer, it was now cold enough for atoms to be neutral. And as soon as this happened, now any light that was there could fly. It just keep going. It's almost like suddenly the fog went away. The fog suddenly went away. Suddenly light then could shine through. So what this means is after this time, whatever light was there starts traveling. And eventually, uh, we should be able to see this light on, from telescopes on the ground. Is there a question about that? I know this is quite complicated, but I wonder if there's a question, just a question about what I'm, what I'm saying. Yes. So are we seeing the first light, or are we seeing the reflection off of this light? Um, what we're seeing is, um, so <laughs> the unit, because the universe was, those are great questions, so thank, thanks for asking. So because the universe was hot, OK, um, it emits radiation, just like any black body would. So if I had a, you know, if I had a rock here and I heated it up to 3,000 degrees, it would emit light. It would emit black body radiation, just like anything that has a temperature. Okay. So everything would be glowing because of this. Now, the thing about it is that any light that was coming out from that glow beforehand would get reabsorbed by stuff because of all these electrons. But after this point, that glow would just shine forth. Okay, so it's kind of that's kind of what we're seeing. We're sort of we're seeing the afterglow of the hot Big Bang. That's what I'm talking about. So this light is like that glow of this hot earlier time that we could look for. Are there are other questions. So what what Dicky said is he said, look, um, well he was doing calculations. Like he didn't really announce it that much, but he was doing these calculations and he was, he was figuring out that this this was happening. That this this could be an observable test that the universe was hot in the beginning and this evidence that this weird Big Bang phenomenon happened. Uh, now, about the same time, there were these guys uh, at Bell Labs. Okay, so in, back then, in the 60s, um, Bell Labs was a, uh, was a place where a lot of fundamental research was done. So this is the, the telephone company. So, so back a long time ago, there was basically only one telephone company. And so... Uh, Bell, Bell, Ma Bell, okay, had a lot of money, so they kind of had a monopoly. But a lot of good things came out of this because they could have this research lab where they could do all kinds of really fundamental research. And one of the things they were doing fundamental research on was radio um, communication. And um, and remember, well, anyway, microwave is a, is a kind of radio wave. <coughs> These guys had built this radio detector, and they were they were testing it. And um, you know they were they were trying to think, trying to build a radio telescope such that they could say look for signals from other people and we could send radio wave signals for practical reasons. Uh, but they found that after they built their radio telescope, they wanted to test it, so they pointed it up in the sky and they they saw a signal, they saw a temperature, and they weren't expecting to see anything. And it looked like a black body temperature of about three degrees Kelvin. So they pointed a different part of the sky. And they keep seeing it. And they're like, man, there's something wrong with my experiment. 
you know, I'm screwed up here, something's wrong. You know, if you've ever taken a lab course in high school or here at UCI, the first thing you think of is, oh, I've done something wrong. You know, there's this, I've screwed up, what did I screw up here? Um, but rather than just kind of fudging their numbers in their lab notebook, they figured that, okay, well, let's figure, let's get to the bottom of this. So, you know, there was some pigeon poop up in the, uh, up in the uh, telescope, so they climbed in there and scrubbed the poop off, so maybe that's what's causing this erroneous signal. Now it's still three degrees everywhere. So finally, uh, one of them called uh, up uh, this guy at Princeton, who's uh, supposed to know about this kind of stuff, Robert Dickey, and said, hey, uh, what, what could be going on here with this three degrees? And of course, he then realized that these guys had discovered the, the afterglow of the Big Bang, that he was all set to go look for, uh, but he had been scooped. Um, and so in 1965, these two guys discovered this. So they, they, they ended up figuring out what this was. They discovered this thing that had been predicted, even though they weren't aware that it had been predicted beforehand. Um, this is now called the Cosmic Microwave Background. Um, and they, en they ended up winning the Nobel Prize for this, for discovering this. Um, so don't fudge your lab notebooks. That's the, that's the advice there. Uh, so what's happening is, I mean, it, just, to, just to clarify what was going on, so it, it, 300,000 years after the Big Bang, we think that the universe was glowing at a temperature of about 3,000 degrees. But then as the universe expanded to today's size, that, that uh, temperature cooled down to only 3 degrees Kelvin. And that's a different black body curve. So there's a flux versus wavelength that changed from this up here in the early universe that what's called redshifted or cooled down this little black body curve here, and this is what this is what Penzias and Wilson were looking for. This is what they were trying to see. Here, here they are. Um, so probably more than any anybody else, you know, these people discovered the Big Bang. Now, this is pretty remarkable because this is a prediction that's based on very basic physics, um, extrapolating. Um, you know, what we see today back, you know, 13 billion years, to make a prediction about what the sky should look like in the microwave, um, and it was and it was discovered. So this was not, you know, no one made this up. So this was this was predicted, and then it was seen. So a lot of people after this point started to say, hey, you know, there's something serious here. Like this is not expected. Um, later on, there, of course, after this was after this was done. Um, where people started studying this signal a lot because you're like, wow, you know, we are seeing, we are basically seeing light that's been traveling more or less uninterrupted since 300,000 after the 300,000 years after the Big Bang to today. So in some sense, it's like a picture of the infant universe, and as we study it, we can learn more about the infant universe. So one of the things that was done is this COBE satellite in 1990 was launched to study the big, to study this, and this curve right here, this this um, red curve is a perfect black body curve. So this is this thing that I told you about long ago in this class. It's predicted from fundamental physics what the shape should be and how it should depend on temperature. And it's a smooth curve like this for an idealized object um, that you know we've actually never seen in nature anything this perfect. Um, and these data points here, these little points, are points observed by the COBE satellite. And these lines here are the uncertainties on the measurements. <laughs> and in fact, those, but those uncertainties have been blown up by a factor of 10 or 100. I can't remember which. But they've been blown up a lot so you can even see them. And this, these measurements lie exactly on top of this prediction. So this, it turns out, is the most perfect black body that's ever been measured, either in the laboratory or anywhere else. Um, so it really is as if the early universe had this hot temperature and we're seeing it. We're seeing the distribution of radiation left over from the Big Bang uh, this way. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that today, when we have telescopes that look in the microwave, we are looking at radiation that left. So this was sort of like the diagram I showed before, where this is supposed to be look back time to some early period of time in the universe. And this is era of the Big Bang. We are looking back to, an eight, to this this point here, just 300,000 years after the Big Bang, we're seeing microwaves coming from that time. Are there questions about this? Yeah? So right now we're seeing the flow from before. 
right now we're seeing the glow from something that happened a long, long time ago. And that's okay, right? Because I see you as you were just a fraction of a millisecond ago because light is taking a finite amount of time to get from you to me. And when I look at the sun, I'm seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. So we're used to, I mean, we're not used to this, but in astronomy, we are constantly doing this. We are constantly looking at signals that are from things that are farther away, and therefore as they were sometime in the past. When we look at the Andromeda galaxy, we see it as it was two and a half million years ago. So as we look at things that are farther and farther away, we're looking back in time. This is as far back as we can possibly look with light, with visible light back to this cosmic microwave background era. So we are seeing back in time, back to this point just 300,000 years after the Big Bang. We study this. Yeah? Um, so I understand like once uh, like atoms kind of form, like that's the point where we can see it, but how do we know that it took 300,000 years to get to that to point? To that point yeah. So that comes down, so I'm, yeah, I, I'm doing something where I'm mixing all the knowledge we have to tell you a story, and I'm only giving you little pieces of why we know what we know. So um, figuring out that 300,000 years piece um, requires a lot more um, detailed study. So one of the ways um, that we can figure that out is partially just from doing this tracking back the expansion history of the universe thing. So if we think we know the rate at which the universe has expanded over its history, we can figure out, okay, well, how small was the universe at, how long ago would we have to go backwards in time until the universe was 3,000 degrees? So that's one way to think about it. So um, we know, for example, that the universe gets twice as hot every time it gets twice as small. So it gets twice as small again, it's another two times hotter. And so it's like a multiplicative thing. How many times do we have to shrink it by a factor of two until we get to a temperature of 30,000 degrees compared to just three degrees a day? <laughs> Um, and we know, in, in the context of knowing everything of, we do know about how the universe has expanded over its history, that's how we have a time, we have a time sequence along that line. There's a lot more information we have than just the signal from the black body. It turns out, although I won't have time to talk about it today, it turns out that the universe is not perfectly three degrees in every single point on the sky. That there are slight variations. So there's actually a pattern to the temperature distributions in the early Big Bang. And from studying that pattern, we can learn a lot about um, what the universe contained in it, and in fact, how old the universe is, and, among, and other things. So there's a lot of detail in those data that I, I just unfortunately don't have time to go into in this class that we've used to sort of string out, you know, ring out even more and more detail over time. Um, so Robert Dickey did not know that the universe was 14 billion years old when he made this prediction. He basically said it's something like 10 billion, 20 billion of that order, and at some point it should have been 3,000 degrees. He didn't know exactly when, but he basically said if it's there, we should be able to see it in the microwave. Um, so in fact, there are uh, several reasons why we believe in this, this theory, which is quite bizarre. You know, this, this theory that there was a big bang is crazy. Uh, unless we had evidence for it. And, and unfortunately, you know, the truth is we have a tremendous amount of evidence for it. And so the first little piece of evidence that something like this was going on was the expansion of the universe. And I've talked to, this, talked to you about this. The next kind of big piece of evidence that something like this was actually going on was this cosmic microwave background signal. Um, but there are other pieces of evidence that this has happened. And I've sort of decided to list four here. Um, because I think there are just substantive things that we can go through. But I must say that in principle, we can make a list that probably goes down to 20 or 25 different things that all fit in with the same picture. Um, but these are kind of big ones that I think I can explain pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> so the two I mentioned here, these first two in yellow, and now I want to move on to this other thing, which has this kind of long, complicated name, uh, primordial nucleosynthesis. Um, primordial means, you know, primordial, the beginning, first. Nucleosynthesis means building nuclei. Okay? What this really meant means is atoms that were made just after the Big Bang. So what I mean by this is, as the universe cools down, um, it turns out that when you have protons and neutrons zooming around each other, at some point those protons and neutrons can find each other and begin to make nuclei. 
So just a, just, a, just a proton by itself is the same as the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. But two protons and two neutrons is the nucleus of a helium atom. Um, so you can build up atoms and different types of nuclei. In principle, if you've got a lot of nu random nucleons, neutrons and protons, floating around in this primordial soup, they can glom together and begin to build up light atoms. So we think that light atoms, many, many light atoms, were made just after the Big Bang. Um, and so, <coughs> so why do I care about this? So as I mentioned, according to this theory, according to this Big Bang theory, before 300,000 years after the Big Bang, so times before this time, so say a year after the Big Bang, it was so hot that light could not travel freely. So we have no hope of seeing signals from that time and thereby checking our, our whole picture of how the universe changed over its history. So if we want to check things about what was going on here, we've got to do it indirectly. So what we would like to do is we'd like to figure out, okay, if what's going on here is what we think is going on here, this, such and such should have happened. And there ought to be a telltale signature of that that we can see today in the universe around us. And what would that be? So one of the things that's, that we can predict and we know what, how to do this is what should have happened to all these nuclei as they're getting together in the early universe. Um, so, <clears throat> about a hundred seconds after the Big Bang, it would have been about a billion degrees. Um, and it turns out that a billion degrees is the relevant temperature you need for protons and neutrons to clomb together and get together and make light nuclei. And what I mean by light nuclei, I mean the ones that are at the very top of the periodic table. So I'm talking about like helium and lithium and to some extent beryllium. Uh, we think we're made in fairly large quantities in the Big Bang. The most abundant element that's made in the Big Bang is hydrogen, but the second most abundant element is helium. And it turns out that based on the conditions of the early universe, how hot it was, how dense it was, how many neutrons and protons there were, and we think in the context of the universe we have, we think we know what that should have been, we can make predictions about, for example, how much hydrogen should have been made for a given amount of helium. Okay. Um, and it turns out, when you make these predictions for how much hydrogen there should have been made in the early universe compared to helium, or the other way around, how much helium compared to hydrogen, um, and then you go out and you look in gas clouds in the universe that look like they haven't been processed in SARS or anything, and you measure how much helium there is, you find that it's in perfect accordance with what you predict from this big bang theory. <coughs> So again, that's not confirmation that this actually happened, but it's something that didn't have to work the way it does, and it works. And how do we measure how much helium there is? Does anyone have to know? How would you go about measuring helium? How much stuff there is in a gas cloud? So there are these things called absorption lines. So when light shines through gas, there's specific types of photons that get absorbed by specific types of atoms. And helium has specific types of light that it likes to absorb. And by measuring that, by looking for that absorption, you can figure out what gas clouds are made of in the universe and then thereby measure its helium. Um, and so this was done, and it turns out this works. So this is another thing. This, this suggests um, you know, that not only do we know at least consistently what was going on 300,000 years after the Big Bang, we can go back to 100 seconds after the Big Bang, make predictions about how many light elements should be made, and that's what we see in gas that's floating around today. So, um, so let me ask you this question. Um, why didn't the light elements form earlier than three minutes after the Big Bang? Does anyone know? What happened, what happened as the universe expanded from the Big Bang? What's the most important thing? It cools down. Okay. So as the universe is expanding, it's cooling down. And so after three minutes, it starts to get cold enough that when the nucleons get really close to each other, they can bind together and make a real nucleus. Before that time, if that happened to happen, all of everything was moving around so fast that they would crash into each other and break apart. So when stuff is too hot, 
these top, even things as simple as nucleons, the nuclei of atoms, sorry, um, even things that were that simple could not exist. It was just too hot. So as the universe cools, more and more complicated things can begin to form. And in that sense, in the early universe, it was actually much simpler than it is today. So you might wonder, how in the heck can you people possibly figure out what, the, what should have been happening three minutes after the Big Ben? Because you can't tell me what the weather is going to be like tomorrow, right? So how can you possibly do this? Well, it turns out there are some questions that are harder than others. And in fact, because it was so hot in the early universe, it's actually really simple to figure out what was going on. It was so hot that nothing complicated could be going on. Okay. Um, I wish I, so like, I mean, for example, it's not that hard to figure out what's going on with water. Like, you have water in a cup. It's not that hard to figure out, like, if you tilt the cup, what's going to happen to the water. As you cool that cup down, it might turn into ice. Predicting exactly where the ice is going to crack, or where the first chunk of ice is going to form, exactly what that ice crystal is going to look like, gets harder and harder. But as I begin to melt the ice, it's not that hard. Like, I might not have any idea exactly what's going to happen, what this ice cube is going to do sitting here sliding around the table. But if you heat up to, you know, 100 degrees, I predict exactly what that's going to be like. It's going to be a puddle of water, right? So in some sense, as stuff gets more complicated, it gets hotter, it gets simpler to predict. And that's one of the reasons why we're so confident in being able to make these predictions in the early universe, because it should be simple. And what it seems to be is that it actually was simple. It actually did start off simple. The stuff gets more complicated as time goes on. So, like, predicting really, like, biology is really hard. Like, physicists cannot calculate things, well, biophysicists can. Like, a physicist like me, like, I have no hope of calculating what's going on, like, with your heart or, you know, something hard like that. But I have a good chance of being able to calculate something very simple, like an isolated system of known temperature and blah, 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 blah. And that's exactly what the early universe is. It's very simple. Um, and so that's why you might think, there's no way these people know what's going on in the early universe. But self-consistently, if it really is that hot, it's actually much simpler to do than figure out what's going on you know, in your head right now. It's a very complicated problem. Um, so, so that's the picture. I just, talk, I just suggested that we can determine indirectly what should have been going on just three minutes after the Big Bang or whatever. And... Uh, that's consistent with what we observed. So that gives us yet another piece of evidence that something like this actually happened. Now, the final piece of evidence that I'm going to talk about is a little bit more nebulous, but it, I think it's still uh, interesting to point out that we see that the universe evolves. So what do I mean by that? Under the cosmic microwave background, from then till today, somewhere between this early time when there was basically nothing but hydrogen and helium, galaxies formed. And within these galaxies, stars formed. And around these stars, planets formed. And so that all happened from here to now, then till now. And because it started, to, according to this theory, according to this Big Bang theory, the universe should have started off smooth and with not much stuff. And today we look around us, there's stuff everywhere we see, everywhere we look. Things changed. There was evolution. So if this is the case, we ought, as we look back in time, as we look at things farther and farther away, we ought to see evidence that the universe is changing as we look appreciable times back, appreciable fractions of ages of the universe back in time. And we see that. Okay, so, um, so let me tell you what I mean. So as we look at things that are farther and farther away, we're looking back, back in time, farther and farther towards this early time. And so if we look at galaxies that are nearby, they look a certain way. And if we look at galaxies that are far away, it turns out they look different. And the universe as a whole looks different. Um, so let me give you an example of this. I'm going to show you a movie uh, that is made of a compilation of surveys um, looking up into the sky. And the most spectacular piece of this movie comes from an observation that was done with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, and what, Hubble, what the Hubble Space Telescope did the director of the, of the institute that governs what happens with Hubble did, um, is uh, they decided to point in one spot of the sky with Hubble for about two weeks straight. Okay? So this would be a, equivalent to, imagine, you know, like if you've done photography, you can open your shutter up for a long time, 
If you open up for a long time, you can take pictures of things that are darker. You know, you change your shutter speed, you can take pictures of things that are darker. So what's, what's done with telescopes is you point at one spot in the sky, and you just leave that shutter open, and you collect photons. And slowly, images build up over time. Okay? So now, we take the best telescope we've got, Hubble, and we point it to one very, very dark spot in the sky. It looks completely dark. It looks completely dark in a pair of binoculars. There's nothing there. And you keep the shutter open for about two weeks. So just point at one spot for two weeks, about, with the shutter open, and you see what picture emerges. And what's remarkable is, so with that, you take the deepest picture of the universe that's ever been done. You're looking at galaxies that are as faint as anything that's ever been seen. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. Okay. Um, we got to turn the lights off for this. So here's a picture of the night sky, and this is the Big Dipper. Okay, just to give you reference. And we're going to look at that crosshair. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep zooming in on that through a number of different surveys that have been done. And eventually we're going to wind up, so we just keep zooming and zooming and zooming in, looking farther and farther back in time at galaxies that are farther and farther away until we get to this picture here. So this image here is a zoom in on the image that was taken by Hubble called the ultra deep field. Now, these galaxies, especially the little red ones that you see, the light from these galaxies left them um, more than three, uh, 13 billion years ago. So we're looking way, 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 way back or to times very close to kind of the Big Bang, at least in the context of galaxy formation. And the other thing that you see here is if you look at some of these little galaxies, they don't really look like galaxies look like today. They look all messed up, basically. Um, you see this guy with some stuff sticking out. This thing looks kind of fluffy. There's sort of a train wreck going on here. Um, this is not what galaxies look like today. So this is just a different picture kind of zoomed out a little bit. Um, so this is the deepest image of the universe that's ever been taken. Um, we think it's possible that there's some of these uh, galaxies, we're seeing them as they were when the universe was more than 10 times smaller than it is now. And therefore, the ambient temperature was 10 times higher, so way back. Um, and like I was saying, if you look at some of these galaxies, they're just all messed up. And in fact, you can type... Hubble Ultra Deep Field into Google, and you can get a really high resolution image of this and look at it, and you'll see it's just filled, filled with galaxies. You can take the full resolution image from Hubble, from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field um, and blow it up to the side, the size of a side of a building, and you'll see full pixel resolution in that picture. That's how uh, detailed it is. Uh, so this is a very low, a low grade image. Uh, here. It's obviously a very large image. I'm not sure the largest one you can get online right now, but you can get a really big one. It's just kind of cool to look at because what you're looking at is things that existed 13 billion years ago in many cases. Um, the context of this lecture, the thing that's interesting about this is the galaxies do not look like uh, galaxies look like in the, in the local universe. They tend to be a lot smaller, for example. They're a lot smaller um, and they're just more messed up looking, like they're in the process of being born, of forming. Are there any questions about that? Um, so, you know, just to emphasize the kind of thing that's very easy for a professor to write a question on for a, an exam in a week is going to be things like, what are the pillars of the Big Bang? Uh, so, you know, know these four. <coughs> so, how did the universe come to look like it looks? Okay. Um, in the context of this theory that we have, so I've told you that I think, at least we think we know what the constituents of the universe are. We think there's this dark matter and this dark energy, a little bit of normal stuff. I think the universe was quite smooth in very early times. So how do you go from that to the universe we see today? So one of the things that um, astronomers have been doing over the last 20 years or so is trying to reproduce the universe in computers. So you code up in a numerical simulation initial conditions, what you think the universe looked like at early times. And what I mean by what we think it looks like, I mean you go back and you look at the cosmic microwave background. You figure out what you think the universe was like at that time based on measurements. You mix in the existence of dark matter and dark energy, as we think 
exists. And then you just you, you, you run the computer simulation forward to figure out what kind of universe should be made um, if these were the ingredients. And so this is a simulation of this kind of thing. The universe has started off, let me back up. The universe starts off very, very smooth. And this is a countdown to the age of the universe here. Uh, it's 12 billion years ago. And what happens is small little fluctuations in the beginning are amplified by gravity. So remember, gravity wants to pull everything near it. So stuff that's a little bit, has a little bit extra stuff around it in the beginning gets more and more extra stuff around it as time goes on because gravity gets drawn in. The objects that you see forming here are, um, are simulated objects that we associate with galaxies. So these will be the formation of individual galaxies. We think these galaxies come together and merge all the time. They align themselves along great filaments that stretch out, you know, 100 million light years on a side. And um, as time progresses, the universe starts, you know, it begins to be a very, it begins as a very smooth universe and ends up as a very clumpy universe, the kind of thing that we see. So if you were to take one of these simulations at the end of the day, what we think of as today, and then evolve, and then fly through it, this is the kind of thing you see. And here, all the bright dots are just dense points where we, we're modeling galaxies, where galaxies should be forming. Um, and so the bright blue points are where galaxies would be forming. As we fly through, you, could, you, you associate this with the distribution of galaxies in the universe on very, very large scales, hundreds, hundreds of millions of light years uh, on a side, side of this box. Now, the remarkable thing about this is you can run these types of simulations. And you can say, okay, well, this is what we predict the universe to be like on very, very large scales. We think galaxies ought to live in these giant filaments and cluster together in clusters like this, um, according to this theory. What should the universe look like today? Um, well, what does the universe look like today in comparison to this? The remarkable thing is that the universe looks a lot like this. Um, so let me show you what I mean. These two slices here, these two triangles up here on the upper left, are are real surveys of the universe. So every point here, every one of these blue points, is a galaxy that's been seen. And the distance to it has been measured using the kind of techniques we talk about in this course. And this is the distance. So the Earth would be here. And because telescopes kind of look out in an angular cone, that's why these are out, these look like these why these look like funny cones. Okay? And it's just a slice. So we take a if you look in this direction on the sky and you look at some slice like that, and I'm just plotting every galaxy out. So that's what this is. And you see that every point is supposed to be a galaxy. And the other thing you notice is as you go to more and more distant universe, the universe sort of changes, and the universe is a little bit different far away than it is nearby. Um, but what's remarkable is this in red is a simulation. This is one of these ab initio simulations that I just showed you. And um, if you look at this by eye, the resemblance is striking. Okay? And there, you can do mat, you know, complicated mathematical comparisons, statistical comparisons between the two distributions, and they're indistinguishable. Um, and so this is the thing that's, you know, this is, this is another reason why we think we at least know something about what's going on. Okay? Because we can actually reproduce what's seen in the real universe inside of computers um, using this this picture, you know, the story, this seemingly fantastic story that I've told you, it seems to work. Okay, um, and so there's just a, there's just a lot of confidence here. The questions about this. Um, now, the other thing that we want to do, you know, we think I told you that I think we understand a little bit about what's going on. We don't want to just understand how these galaxies distribute themselves in the universe. We want to understand why galaxies look the way they do in detail. Okay, so the other thing about the universe, it just looks cool. We want to understand, you know, why do galaxies look like this? Um, now, it turns out that's actually a harder question than the whole universe. <laughs> Forming individual galaxies, it turns out, that, that question is harder than, than understanding what the global universe looks like. Um, and, but, but there's progress in that direction, too. And I wanted to show you a movie of a, of a simulation of the formation of an individual galaxy, again, just because it's kind of cool looking. Uh, so what you're going to see in this movie is 
there's a distribution of matter that's going to expand with the expansion of the universe, and then it falls together very quickly, recollapses by gravity to form galaxies. It's the whole region is first expanding, and then it recollapses to form um, a galaxy. So that's, that's what's going to be shown here. So that happened really fast, <laughs> expanded very fast, and then in the center of this region, you see the core nucleus of a galaxy beginning to form. And you'll notice that in the beginning, it's a very complicated, messed up process. Much like all those galaxies that I showed you in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. But as time goes on, things become a bit more ordered. Now in this picture, the blue things that you see are stars forming. Um, and then this other stuff is gas. So you'll see gas being accreted onto this galaxy and stars forming at the same time. Notice that it's a very um, complicated process. There's all kinds of galaxies that are ramming into each other all the time. But eventually you develop this nice spiral looking disk which is a lot like the little spirals that we see today. <coughs> there's even a bar in the middle of this galaxy. We think that there's a bar in the Milky Way. So, um, you know, it's this kind of picture. Again, this, is, this movie is obviously extremely rapid. It takes 14 billion years for this to happen. This is the process that we think, at least currently we think, uh, gives rise to all the, the pretty galaxies that you see in the sky. This cat merges. Well, it kind of looks like this from now on out. So basically, the galaxy has formed, and now it's just going to keep spinning for a while uh, until we get until we get to the present day. Um, I'll let that re I'll let that run. Does anyone have any questions about anything? <laughs> what? <laughs> is it funny? Okay. I, I like funny things, you can say it. Yeah. <laughs> um so that's a good so the question is was gravity there before the big game before the Big Bang, or was it just time and space that began the Big Bang? So um we think everything began, well, this is a complicated question. So um, one answer is, in the simplest incarnation, everything begins at the Big Bang. So including all the laws of nature, there was nothing before it. Um, there, are other, uh, there are extensions to this standard picture of the Big Bang. There is something else, <laughs> this kind of pre-Big Bang universe that existed. And there's, um, there's an idea that there are actually multiple universes. And the, the idea with that is that their um, universes kind of are born of this primordial multiverse that existed. And as the universe are, universes are born, um, the laws of physics get established with that, in that universe get established. So you might admit there are ideas now that there might be other universes where Newton's constant was different, or the law of gravity was a little different. It wasn't just one over R squared, maybe it was something else. Um, and so it just so happened that in our universe, we got this set of laws, this set of fundamental parameters, and in another universe, it was a different set of laws and different set of fundamental parameters. Um, and there's a certain amount of randomness that goes into sort of setting what the laws are that we were given as opposed to some other universe. Um, and so it's possible that something like that is going on. This is very speculative in, in borderline philosophy and not really science, but there are scientists that think about it. And people ask questions like, there are arguments called anthropic arguments, which go something like this. Um, you know, why is there, um, you know, why, why, why do neutrons and protons weigh what they do? Um, and one way to answer that question is you could say, well, what would have happened in the early universe if they didn't weigh what they weigh? If, they were, if their mass difference was a lot different. And you can calculate that in those universes, you never make any helium or you make nothing but helium and no hydrogen. In which case it would be very hard to have stars that lived a long time. In which case you would never have life. Therefore, we reject that universe is not possible for us because we have life. And so you can, you can make these arguments of you know, why, you know, why do you think, why are the physical constants as they are? Because well, if they weren't that way, then we wouldn't exist. So there are arguments like that that are called anthropic that people try to make 
And again, it's not clear that those arguments are really hardcore scientific arguments or they're more philosophical arguments, but those are the kind of things that people, people talk about in this context. Um, whenever you start talking about stuff like before the Big Bang or any even things like why the universe is the way it is, it's, it, it's borderline not science anymore because what science is all about is telling you what the universe is like, not why the universe is like that. And it's not about providing moral ans answers to moral questions, it's just providing answers to you know, empirical questions. Uh, so that's why those que that's why I'm always those are the funnest questions to ask. But that's also why I'm I'm always a little even though I think it's fun to even try to answer them, I'm always a little hesitant to answer them because you know I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah. How would you talk about dark matter and dark energy in the context of the so that's a good question. So for dark matter it's interesting because we think that the dark matter was actually created in the Big Bang. Um, this is much harder to test, but we think that the dark matter was actually created in the Big Bang sometime up in this, this area. So before, <laughs> before normal atoms, we think. Um, the dark matter was kind of born and set up. Its existence was set up up in this area. Um, dark energy, much harder to think about. Um, it's unclear if dark energy was created or just endowed upon us by the universe itself. You know, is it put it another way, maybe it's just built into the fabric of the universe itself and just is there. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, or, or is it something else more complicated? I mean, the dark energy stuff is just is really not a good answer to anything. But the dark matter, there are a lot of good theories for what it how it was made and how it was born here. Um, I know that wasn't a very easy to understand question answer, but Anything else? Yeah? With the universe like expanding and coinciding, will sometime hit like absolute zero? Uh, the question is with the universe continuing to expand and cool, will it sometimes hit absolute zero? Um, so it will never hit perfectly absolute zero, but right now it's three degrees. As it expands twice as big, it'll be one and a half degrees, and etc. So it will asymptote to zero. And the interesting thing about this actually is um, Currently, right now, as I told you, that we think the universe is accelerating in its expansion. And what that means is it's getting cold fast. So it's cooling off very, very rapidly. So you can imagine, as soon as the, you know, as soon as the universe expands another factor of 10 or 100 from what it is today, this background temperature that was discovered in the 60s is going to be really, really cold. The signal is going to be very, very faint because it's going to be even coming from even farther away, very, very dim. And you can envision that other civilizations that are born after ours, you know, billions of years from now in say, some other galaxy or even within our own galaxy, um, won't be able to detect this. And in fact, they most, if our current picture is correct, all the galaxies will get, will be blown up, will accelerate so far away that we won't be able to see them either. When I say we, I mean future thinking thing, things that think. Uh, <laughs> So far away that no future civilization will even be able to see the other galaxies and only be able to see our own galaxy. So you can envision in the far, far future of the universe in some future civilization, you will only see, um, you won't see any signal from the cosmic microwave background. It won't be observable because it'll be too cold and too faint. You won't see any other galaxies because they'll be so far away, light, the light will never get to us. So all you will know is that you live in a ball of stars. And so those far future civilizations will think that the universe is a ball of stars and that's it. So like the people like the Curtis Shapley picture, you know, back in those days what they thought the universe was like. And those those people will never ever have the chance of discovering how rich of a universe they live in. They'll just think they live in a ball of stars and that's the end of it from the beginning of it. So you know that's why we have to study astronomy now, because you know <laughs> four hundred billion years from now we're <laughs> so okay. So tell your Congress people that we'll be all good. Okay, um, I guess that's it. So good luck on your final projects. Hopefully you're well in, you're almost done. And uh, we'll talk on Tuesday about the tests.